and philosophy. We believe that outdated cliches from all sides need to be transcended through open discussion. A fresh, objective platform has now come of age where the world's thinkers can take a journey through human thought. We believe that this is a much needed window of opportunity within a polarized, contemporary world to facilitate the emergence of new voices of requisite reason. So I welcome you all to this, to this evening's debate, which is a pertinent and vital one, as it determines the very meaning and purpose of human existence. Both participants will attempt to answer the, the following questions. Where did we come from? Where are we going? And where are we headed as the human race? This is a question that all human beings have asked themselves throughout history. And if you are not interested in the answer to these questions, then you're really in the wrong place, because Madame Tussauds is just up the road. And in case you ask, I don't work for their sales and marketing department, but I will certainly wax lyrical about tonight's discussion. Just some ground rules. The way that this debate will be structured is as follows. Each speaker will start with 25 minutes, with a maximum of five minutes extra for their opening speeches. There will be 10 minutes rebuttals for each speaker. There will be a discussion between the two speakers for a few minutes. Then there will be a chance for you, the audience, to take part through the question and answer session. And then finally, each speaker will be invited to round up with a three-minute summary speech. Just to tell you a little bit about our participants tonight, First, we have Dr. Ed Buckner. He has been the president of American Atheists since September 2008. He's been a professor, a technical school administrator, and executive director of the Council for Secular Humanism. He and his wife have ever edited several books and published Oliver Hall's Taking the Harder Right. Ed wrote the concluding chapter of Kimberly Blaker's Fundamentals of Extremism. He also co-edited the book, Quotations that support the separation between church and state. And he's also contributed to the new Encyclopedia of Unbelief with several entries. He has authored Secular Schooling in Parenting Beyond Belief and co authored This is a Free Country, Not a Christian na Nation, with Michael E. Buckner in Everything You Know About God is Wrong. Buckner has debated and spoken across the US, often about the Treaty of Tripoli. Now this was a treaty between the American government and the Ottoman province of what is now today modern Libya and where the, where the President of the United States stated explicitly that the United States is not founded on a Christian foundation. Dr. Ed Buckman has also given the talk No More Lives which was featured at the Godless Americans March on Washington in 2002. He also serves on several national advisory boards and committees. In case you're wondering, Dr. Buckner will be making the case for atheism. Hamza Zortis. Hamza is a Greek convert to Islam, who is a speaker and writer on Islam, philosophy and politics. Hamza has debated prominent academics and intellectuals and delivers presentations across the world on various topics, ranging from does God exist to can we live better lives without religion. He is a regular speaker at university campuses and has also lectured and debated abroad, most notably in the United States, Lebanon, and Malaysia. He has authored a number of publications, including the website, The Inimitable Quran, as well as serializing a number of articles on his blog. He has also led a major piece of research on non-Muslim perceptions on Islam through IERA, which is the Islamic Education and Research Academy, of which he is a senior staff member. He is one of the main protagonists in using Western and Islamic philosophy to defend and explain the religion of Islam. His hobbies include boxing as well as martial arts. He has also recently discovered the joys of DIY plumbing. So I'm sure he won't be pulling any punches this evening, and we and he will hope that his arguments are also fight. So I'll now ask Hamza, first of all, to come up to the lectern and present his argument for Islam in tonight's debate. Islam versus atheism, you decide. I'm going to start as Muslims do in the name of God. In Alhamdulillah, was salatu was salamu ala rasulillah, amma ba'd. I greet you all, brothers, sisters, and friends, with the Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
Brothers and sisters and friends, today we have an interesting question. Islam or atheism, you decide. Now, before I get into the thick of my argument, I would like to propose something. I would argue that the way human beings must make decisions in their life is a, the way that critical thinkers should make decisions in their lives. Now, you may think this is fancy philosophy. It's not. What I actually mean is that we must base our decisions on ration and reason and common sense. Something that myself and Ed Buckner will agree upon. Let me elaborate with an example. Say, for example, we're at home in our living room and we're watching the football, okay? And at 9 o'clock in the evening, someone knocks on the door. Knock, knock. Okay. We look through the spyglass and we see Superman with his red underpants. And he says... I'm here to check the gas. And you're thinking, he's here to check my gas meter? That doesn't make sense. So using your reasoning, using your common sense, your critical thinking, you're going to actually phone the gas company and say, do you actually come at 9 o'clock in the evening? And have you changed your uniform policy? Significantly, you're going to be crying out through the door saying, excuse me, sir, can I see some ID? Can I see some paperwork? And from this analogy or this example, we have come to realize that we must use our common sense, our previous information, our intellect, our rational capacities in order to make decisions in our lives. And I would argue today that to support the atheist worldview would be equivalent of allowing someone in their red underpants to come and check your gas meter. Whereas someone supporting the Islamic worldview would be the one with the slightly more critical thinking. And the way I'm going to do this is first suspend my judgment about atheism and wait for Dr. Ed Buckner to respond or provide a good case for the atheist worldview. And now what I'm going to do is provide a positive case for the Islamic worldview. Now what is the Islamic worldview? Now the Islamic worldview is based upon three intellectual foundations. One, the existence of God. Two, the Quran being divine. And three, the truthfulness of the prophets sallallahu alaihi wasallam peace and blessings be upon him claim to prophethood so i'm going to go straight to the first argument god's existence now brothers sisters and friends god makes sense of the origins of the universe because we have all asked the same question why does something exist rather than nothing how did the universe come to being in this light the quran the book of the muslims points to this type of thinking as the quran says or do they think the heavens and the earth, the whole universe, came out of nothing? Now typically, atheists have responded by saying that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. For example, Bertrand Russell, the famous atheist on the radio program, he said the universe is just there and that's all. However, brothers sisters and friends, if we conclude, or if we scratch the surface on this statement, we will conclude that it is absurd and irrational. Because that would mean that the universe never had a beginning. Which would then mean that our history is infinite. That the universe has an infinite history of past events. But I ask you the question, can this really be the case? Can we have an infinite history? The answer is no. Because the infinite does not exist in the real world. Take the following examples into consideration. Example number one. Say we have an infinite number of Dr. Ed Buckners in the room, okay? <laughs> Whether we like that or not, okay? <laughs> Say we take two Dr. Ed Buckners away, how many Dr. Ed Buckners do we have left? Infinite, as Dr. Ed Buckner has just said. But logically, it's infinity minus two. And if it's infinity minus two, it's less than infinity. And if it's less than infinity, we should be able to count how many Dr. Ed Buckners are in the room. But we can't. It just exists in the mathematical realm of discussion of discourse. Example number two. Now say we have a hundred Dr. Ed Buckners in the room. And at every possible moment, I add another Dr. Ed Buckner. 101, 102, 1001, 1002, a million and one, a million and two. Will I ever reach a number that we can describe as infinite? No, because at every possible moment, I can add another Dr. Ed Buckner. 
So, in this light, the mathematicians Kazman and Newman, they said the infinite certainly does not exist in the same sense as we say there are fish in the sea. And significantly, brothers, sisters and friends, the famous German mathematician David Hilbert, he said the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But brothers, sisters and friends, past events are real. They're not just ideas. Therefore, the number of past events cannot be infinite. Therefore, there was a beginning to the universe and it logically follows there was a cause to the universe. This is why leading cosmologists and philosophers of science such as Ellis, Kirchner and Stoger, they ask and they answer in the following way. They said, can there be an infinite set of really existing universes? We suggest that on the basis of well-known philosophical arguments, the answer is no. Now, this may sound like philosophical mumbo jumbo. Let's talk about science, okay? What does astrophysical evidence have to say? What does science have to say about this? Now, I would argue that this conclusion is also supported by physics. As you know, you've heard of the Big Bang. Everyone heard of the Big Bang? Hands? Good, and I assure you it's not that thing that happens after too many curries. <laughs> okay, according to the Big Bang, physical time and space was created and matter and energy were also created. The four prominent scientists, Jay Richards, James E. Gunn, David N. Schramm, and Beatrice M. Tinley, they describe the event of the Big Bang as follows. The universe began from a state of infinite density, space and time were created in that event, and so was all matter in the universe. I ask you another question. What does infinite density actually mean? Well, it actually means nothing. This is why Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle, he states, that the universe at a point in the past was shrunk down to nothing at all. So let's reflect on this. It would actually mean that a proponent of the Big Bang theory or model would require us to believe that something comes from nothing. i ask you another question. Out of, does something come from nothing? No, because out of nothing, nothing comes. This is why even atheist philosophers such as David Hume he wrote in a letter, I never asserted to absurd proposition as that anything might arise without a cause. Similarly, P.J. Zwart in his publication about time said, if there is anything we find inconceivable, it is that something could arise from nothing. And we even have the eminent physicist, Sir Arthur Eddington concluding, the beginning seems to present insuperable difficulties unless we agree to look on it as frankly supernatural. So we can conclude based on mathematical, philosophical, and scientific evidence that there's a cause for the universe. It doesn't mean it's God, doesn't mean it's Jesus, doesn't mean it's Allah, it doesn't mean anything. It just means there's a cause for the universe. So we ask another question, what is the nature of this cause? And the nature of this cause upon conceptual analysis, which means critical thinking, thinking about this cause, we come to some startling conclusions. This cause must be one. The reason for this is because if we use the philosophical principle Occam's razor, which posits that we do not multiply entities beyond necessity, then we conclude it must be one. This cause must be uncaused, as we have already discussed the absurdity of an infinite regress of events, similarly with causes. This cause must be immaterial because it created the sum of all matter, which is the universe itself. Significantly, brothers, sisters, and friends, this cause must be personal. The reason I'm saying this is how else can a, an eternal cause bring into an existence a finite effect, the universe that had a beginning in time? It must have chosen the universe to come into existence, and choice indicates a will, and a will indicates a personality. So, we have concluded the traditional view on God that a transcendental, immaterial, uncaused, eternal being exists. Let me summarize the argument for you. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore the universe has a cause. 
Then they go straight to the second argument, which is about the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. The Qur'an being a signpost to the transcendent. What I mean by this is that the Qur'an can only be best explained by the fact that it is a divine book. And I'm going to use the inimitability of the Qur'an for this. Now what do I mean by inimitability? What I mean by inimitability is that the Qur'an cannot be emulated, reproduced, matched or copied with regards to its literary and linguistic features. And this has a Qur'anic drive. In the Qur'an, which is the book of the Muslims in the second chapter, the Qur'an says, and if you are in doubt, talking to the whole of humanity here, to the secularists, to the atheists, to the agnostics, those sitting on the fence, those in the fence, talking to everyone. If you are in doubt about this book, which we have sent down to our servant, referring to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then bring one single chapter like it and call on your witnesses and your supporters and your thinkers and your philosophers and your scientists and your Dr. Ed Buckners if you are actually truthful. And this challenge, brave challenge, has a historical backdrop too. The famous Arab historian Ibn Rashik, he states that the Arabs at the time of Revelation, over 1400 years ago, were Arabic linguists par excellence. They were the best at expressing themselves in the Arabic tongue. This is why he says that the only time the Arabs used to celebrate was on the birth of a boy and when a poet rose amongst them. Now this inimitability, this matchlessness, this inability for humanity to try and copy the Quran has been testified by many Western and Eastern academics. For example, A.J. Arbery, the famous translator of the Quran and the famous Orientalist, he said, for the Quran is neither prose nor poetry, but a unique fusion of both. And there are many reasons why the Quran cannot be matched or copied from a linguistic perspective. Some of these reasons include its unique literary form, its peak of eloquence, its unique linguistic genre, and its abundance of rhetorical devices. Now you don't have to know anything technical about this, but just to let you know that there are key cogent arguments for the inimitability of the Quran. Hence, Paul Casanova in April 1909 at the College of France spoke about the linguistic power of the Quran. And he says, whenever Muhammad وسلم, was asked a miracle as a proof of the authenticity of his mission, he quoted the composition of the Quran and its incomparable excellence as proof of its divine origin. And in fact, even those who are non-Muslims, nothing is more marvelous than its language with such apprehensible plentitude and grasping sonority. But I think I could hear the question in your head. And I think it's saying something like this. Well, how does it make it divine? How does it make it come from God? How does it make it a miracle? And that's a very good question. But as we agreed, we're going to use our logic. And if we use logic, we will come to that conclusion. And I'm going to use something called logical deduction. What is logical deduction? Logical deduction is a thinking process where you start with a universally accepted statement and from that, drawing logical conclusions. But I think there's another question in your head. And the other question in your head is, but I don't know nothing about the Arabic language. I mean, most of us come from the Asian subcontinent. So what do we know about Arabic? Another very good question. Well, you don't have to know, every, you don't have to know anything about the Arabic language. Put your hand up if you really believe that China exists. Good. Now, put your hand up if you've been to China before. Eight people. So for the majority of us, we still believe China exists. And I asked the majority of us, have you ever spoken to a Chinese person before? In China. <laughs> have you eaten Chinese food? In China. Wo hen ying wo cha. I want some English tea. So we haven't done this, but we believe that China actually exists. But you may argue, but it's on the map. Well, if I drew you a map and I said, this is planet Zongo, and I'm a Zongolian, and I come from the planet Zugula, does that mean it really exists? No. But the reason we believe this, and if we study epistemology, the study of knowledge, we will come to the conclusion that we believe in these things because it's testimony, it's recurrent reporting, it's a universally accepted statement. This is why the philosopher and historian C.A.J. Cordy in his book, Testimony, a Philosophical Study, he highlights our dependency on 
on this very fact. And he says, many of us have never seen a baby born, nor have most of us examined the circulation of the blood, nor the actual geography of the world, nor any fair sample of the laws of the land. Nor have we made the observations that lie behind our knowledge that the lights in the sky are heavenly bodies immensely distinct. So, I would argue, for you to reject the miraculous nature of the Qur'an will be equivalent of saying that China does not exist and even saying that the world is not round. We believe it's round, why? Have we actually felt its roundness? Have we gone to Australia and had a huge headache? No. So the point I'm trying to make is that it's based upon recurrent reporting. Now what is the universally accepted statement with regards to the Qur'an based upon Eastern and Western scholarship? Well, it is as follows. Those best placed to challenge the Qur'an have failed to meet its challenge. And there is a consensus amongst Western, non-Muslim, Eastern, Muslim scholarship. For example, the highly acclaimed professor and Arabist Hamilton Gibb, he states, the Meccans still demanded of him a miracle, and with remarkable boldness and self-confidence, Muhammad appealed as a supreme confirmation of his mission to the Qur'an itself. Like all Arabs, they were connoisseurs of language and rhetoric. Well then, if the Qur'an were his own composition, other men could rival it. Let them produce ten verses like it, and if they could not, and it is obvious that they could not, let them accept the Qur'an as an outstanding evidential miracle. Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University in his book, The Qur'an, A Biography, he says, as tangible signs, Qur'anic verses are expressive of inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, laid within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. So let's now draw the logical conclusions. We know the book can actually come from an Arab, a non-Arab, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or God himself. Now firstly, the Qur'an could not have come from an Arab because the Arabs at the time of Revelation who were the best place to challenge the Qur'an, the Arabic linguists par excellence, failed to challenge the Qur'an. They haven't even admitted that it could not come from a human being. For example, the best linguist of the time, his name was Walid ibn al-Muhira, he says, by God, this cannot come from a human being. The Qur'an could not have come from a non-Arab because obviously you need to know the Arabic language in order to successfully challenge the Qur'an. Now I think the most important point lies in the fact that many people claim that the author was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the Prophet Muhammad could not have been the author. The reason being because he was an Arab himself. And like all Arabs, they failed, so he's included in that logically. Significantly, the Arabic linguists at that time never accused him of being an author. He said it, they would say things like, it's magic. Significantly, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had amazing trials and tribulations in his 23 year prophetic career. His beloved wife died. His young children passed away. He was boycotted from his beloved city. His companions, beloved companions were tortured and killed. He loved children so much that he would almost curse someone for not kissing their children. But he was stoned by children in a town in Arabia where the blood was dripping from his legs where the scholars would say that his sandals were stuck to the sand. This was the reality of the Prophet Muhammad Muslims and non-Muslims agree to this. But yet none of this emotion is in the Quran itself. This is a psycholinguistic impossibility. When you read Shakespeare, some of Shakespeare is in Shakespeare. When you read Homer, some of Homer's work is in Homer. Anyone studying psycholinguistics, which I have done, study grounded theory or discourse analysis, you would see that this author, some of his personalities in this author. But the Quran remains in the divine voice, and many studies have shown this to be the case. Another example why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa can't be the author is because his narrations which have been preserved are in a different distinct style to that of the Qur'an. And to keep that consistently over a 23 year period is almost impossible. Now the greatest point is this, the greatest point is this. Human expression, if we have the blueprint, we can emulate it. For example, if you study art, we have the artwork of Monet, he was an impressionist. Wow, amazing art. At that time. 
But now you can copy it. We have many replicas of the same art. But we have the Quran today, a timeless book, 1400 years. We have the blueprint to the words, the letters, the sounds, the grammar, and the meaning, yet we cannot emulate the blueprint. This shows to me that none of the explanations above suffice. So we can only come to the conclusion that the best explanation of the inimitability of the Quran is the divine himself. So let's summarize the arguments as follows. One, the Quran could have come from an Arab, a non-Arab, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, or God. Two, it couldn't have been an Arab, a non-Arab, or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Three, therefore it must have been from God. Let's go to the third and final argument. The truthfulness of the claim of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to prophethood itself. We have four options. Borrowing from C.S. Lewis, we have four options. That the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was a liar, he was deluded, he was both, or he was speaking the truth. And let's take each option and use our critical thinking that we agreed that we're going to use in the beginning. Let's take that he's a liar. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam could never have been a liar. As we said, he was boycotted, he was stoned. He used to sleep on palm fibers when the kings of Persia and the Byzantines and the Romans were living it high. He never had any worldly gain. He was offered riches, he was offered power, but rejected it for his message. So this is not the psychological profile of a liar. And this is why sincere orientalists such as W. Montgomery Watt, Watt in his book Muhammad at Mecca, he said, his readiness to undergo persecution for his beliefs, the high moral character of the men who believed in him and looked up to him as a leader, and the greatness of his ultimate achievement all argue his fundamental integrity. To suppose Muhammad an imposter raises more problems than it solves. Moreover, none of the great figures of history is so poorly appreciated in the West as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Significantly, Sir George Bernard Shaw in the volume The Genuine Islam, he said, I have always held the religion of Muhammad in high estimation because of its wonderful vitality. It is the only religion which appears to me to possess the assimilating capacity to the changing phase of existence which can make itself appeal to every age. I have studied him, the wonderful man, and in my opinion, far from being an antichrist, he must be called the savior of humanity. Let's go to the next option. We are clutching at intellectual straws here. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was deluded, some people say. But can this really be the case? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa gave us wisdom and advice about developing an economic model for society. Something which American scholars come all the way to Britain to propagate the economic message of Islam. Is this from a deluded person? Someone who thinks he's saying the truth, but in reality is an untruth? Of course not. Look at geopolitics, for example. The liberal capitalist Western model, they believe that there's too many needs, not enough resources, hence excessive competition. But how did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa solve the number one economic problem of the 21st century? He said something very simple, that we have essential limited needs and enough resources. When we study geopolitics, we find that there's enough resources in the planet to feed 36 billion people. There's only about 7 billion people at the moment. So is this from a deluded person? Of course not. This is why Michael Hart, in the book The 100, a ranking of the most influential persons in history, he says, my choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others, but he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both secular and religious levels. So how can a deluded person be successful religiously and from a secular perspective? Is this the product of a deluded man? What about the third option? He was both. Well, this is logically and philosophically impossible. You can't know that you're lying and keep a lie and think you're saying the truth, yet it's an untruth at the same time. So what are we left, brothers, sisters, and friends? We are left that he's speaking the truth. And I think the following quotation from Dr. William Draper in his book, The History of Intellectual Development of Europe, summarizes his point quite nicely. He says, 
Four years after the death of Justinian, AD 569, was born in Mecca, in Arabia, the man who of all men has exercised the greatest influence upon the human race. To be the religious head of many empires, to guide the daily life of one third of the human race, may perhaps justify the title of messenger of God. So we could summarize this argument as follows. One, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could have been a liar, deluded both, or speaking the truth. Two, he wasn't a liar, deluded or both, based upon our critical analysis. Three, therefore, he was speaking the truth. So brothers, sisters, and friends, these are very simple arguments that could be understood by an eight-year-old eight or an 80-year-old. The existence of God, the miracle of the Qur'an, and the truthfulness of the Prophet's claim to prophethood, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I have attempted to show that there are good reasons to choose the Islamic worldview because human beings, as we agreed in the beginning, must base their decisions on our rational faculties, on our reason and our common sense. I believe in order for Dr. Ed Bakhna to be successful, he must break down each of my arguments and then con construct new ones for the atheist worldview. So brothers, sisters and friends, I simply leave you with the words of the people of paradise. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Unquestionably, all praise are due to God. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Wa astaghfirullah wa tawbu ilayk. Jazakallahi for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. I had a little bit of um, trepidation about coming to uh, England, uh, which is sort of known for its chilly social relations in some ways. Uh, that was countered a little bit by my knowledge, and my knowledge of Islam is very superficial, but my knowledge that Islam is known worldwide for its hospitality and its graciousness. Uh, my wife and I uh, sat on the tarmac in Georgia for two hours before our plane even took off, and we are old and creaky, at least I am, and uh, I didn't sleep. We arrived at the uh, airport, uh, basically having missed a night's sleep and frustrated and angry with an airline, and we were greeted with five or six uh, young men with candy and with a fl beautiful flowers for my wife, Warmly and graciously, uh, we were uh, taken by Hamza, not Hamza, but a different Hamza, he was here a moment ago, uh, to our uh, hotel and treated in every moment with respect and gracious uh, hospitality, uh, which I would have expected from Islam, but you know, England, not so sure. If, if the hospitality alone were enough to convey and win the argument, I would have to give up. But unfortunately, or fortunately, from my point of view, that does not settle the issue. I, I do greet you uh, as brothers and sisters. I, I am uh, not necessarily speaking for all atheists now, but I am speaking for myself. I can consider all of my fellow human beings to be brothers and sisters, and friends or potential friends, interesting people. Uh, Hamza, the lion, <laughs> Sorts, Georges. I'll never get his last name right, but believe me when I tell you, I respect him, and if I call him Mr. Georges or Hamza, I am speaking with respect. He's obviously the better looking. He's uh, the more polished speaker. Uh, he's much better known, at least in the UK. Uh, he has all of these things going for him, but it is very much an unfair fight because history and logic are on my side. So he will lose the debate for those of you who are open-minded and are interested in the truth. And that is not a fair thing for such a sophisticated, intelligent, uh, effective speaker. I also ask that you do forgive me uh, for my ignorance uh, regarding uh, Islam. Uh, I have no intention to say anything offensive. The fact that I do not agree with you may, in fact, be offensive to some people, and that I cannot help uh, because I do not agree with you. I don't actually expect to persuade you. I know the, the title is You Decide. My best guess is nobody's going to decide anything different from what they started out with tonight. 
uh, whether you're Islamic or atheist, you're likely to continue to be. Uh, I think uh, I'm about as likely to persuade Hamza Georgis as he is to persuade me, which is to say not very. But I do think there are things to learn, and I am very interested in learning about Islam and about Islamic thought. But I, uh, my purpose in this original talk is to explain to you as much as I can in 20 or 30 minutes uh, why I'm an atheist. And uh, there are a number of reasons, and some of them are more philosophical and some are less. I agree with some of what uh, my opponent uh, said. I do believe we have an epis uh, I hang up on that word, ep epistemic duty, epistemic duty uh, to investigate, to find out, to learn, to test truth. Uh, W.K. Clifford uh, wrote a telling essay on this, uh, in my opinion, about a ship owner who is not allowed simply to say, oh, the ship is in good shape, send it on out into the ocean. He must actually investigate and find out whether it is in good shape before he risks the lives and the cargo and so forth. Uh, people like Tom Flynn and Keith Parsons brought that particular essay to my attention, and I think it's very telling. We must have systematic tests for truths, and those tests must be independent of the conclusion that we think maybe we're going to wind up with. Uh, it was mentioned in the introduction of me uh, that my wife and I uh, published a book by Oliver Halley, who's a good friend. And Oliver is the one who told me that when you're thinking about religious views, you must, as Hamza suggested, you must test for truth. It's not good enough just to take something that's appealing or interesting. You must Test it for truth. If you accept with investigation and with care uh, a religious viewpoint that is based on a more recent prophet, that, has, that is based on a holy book that came from that prophet and a revelation from God, uh, then maybe you will understand why I reject Islam. But if you will accept the Book of Mormon and, and Joseph Smith uh, and the five golden tablets and all of that sort of thing without investigation, then maybe you will not be able to understand uh, my argument. It is very important that we human beings, it's, you know, if, if I tell you my uh, uh, favorite ice cream uh, flavor is chocolate, you can accept that without any investigation. It doesn't have any consequence. If I tell you that I am Superman and I am here to check your gas meter at 9 o'clock at night while you're watching football, that's that sport where you kick things through the uprights and pass the ball? No? Maybe not. Okay, soccer to us Americans. Uh, then you should exercise your uh, epistemic duty and uh, call the gas company. Uh, and in cases of religion, you must do that, and I think if you do, you will, in fact, uh, become an atheist or remain an atheist. I'm going to talk about seven different points. Uh, epistemic duty, the fact that there is, in fact, no good reason not to be an atheist and therefore one should be one. The fact that there is no coherent objective concept of God or Allah available to us at all. The fact that religion usually not always, but usually makes things worse for human beings, at least in the long run, not better. The fact that there is evil and suffering and that the kind of evil and suffering we find in this world, and I know Hamza has written about this subject. I see you looking at him. Yes, I know he's written about it. The kind of evil and suffering that we find in this world is incompatible, not just with a Christian concept of God, but with Allah, with any concept of an intelligent and creative designer of this universe. Sixth, the fact that demography predicts religious belief much better than theology. Throughout the world, you will find geography and culture predicting what somebody's reliefs, religious beliefs are much better than their understanding of particular religious beliefs. And that goes for atheists as well as uh, as, as well as it goes uh, for Islamic believers. Uh, 
And seventh, that there is no objective morality available to us human beings. No morality that comes from outside of humankind. And we'll talk about all of those things. If I don't get to all of them, then I'll cheat and do it in the rebuttal. You expect atheists to cheat, right? Uh, I've talked about the uh, epistemic duty. Can't talk about it much because I keep mispronouncing the word. But let's go uh, to the second point. In short, and I think I would be within my uh, philosophical rights, although it wouldn't be very smart debating technique, uh, simply to say there's no case been made and sit down. Because I don't think any case has been made tonight or in the thousands of books that have been written to defend theism and ideas of God. There is no evidence, there is no logic, there is no basis for believing in a, in a supernatural being that holds up under careful scrutiny and under examination. I am an atheist and you should be one as well because of our epistemic duty, because of the things that Hamza talked about earlier. The default should be non-belief. If you don't have a good enough reason to believe, then you should be an atheist, and all of you should be. Let's talk about the uh, fact that there is no coherent, much less objective, concept of what we even mean when we say God or Allah. I know that Muslims say Allah has many names, and they explain this as evidence that there's all sorts of contradictory and different faces of God and so forth. But when you examine it carefully, it doesn't hold up. These things that are contradictory are still contradictory. And the fact that you have different names for a, a just or a punisher or an angry uh, Allah as well as for a compassionate one does not resolve the uh, impossibility of a coherent and objective God. And we know that the uh, 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 my opponent has written about this. We know that there is no objective concept of God because there is nothing that's come from outside of humankind, and humankind has vastly different opinions and conclusions about what one or more gods look like, act like, etc. We'll come back uh, to that some, but the concept uh, is sufficiently incoherent that it is not worth devoting your life to or destroying others. Religion, and by that term, this particular point, I'm trying to be very broad. I, in fact, am even including some things where there is no belief in a God, uh, Marxism uh, in particular, some cases and so forth. A belief system that you think cannot be questioned, that you think has to be right, including all of the world's major uh, religions, has these belief systems do more harm than good in the long run. They impede the development of knowledge. They, they don't end or destroy science, but they interfere with the progress that's available from science. They oppose it most often. In the case of wars, wars, uh, of course, are fought for many different reasons. Even the most obviously religious uh, entangled wars are fought for reasons other than just religion. They're fought over land and over power struggles and all these sorts of things. But without a doubt, the wars that we human beings have fought with each other are worsened by people believing that they, whichever side in a particular struggle they're on, are fighting on God's side and that God has commanded them to go forward and kill the enemy. Religion makes it easier to dehumanize your enemy. And when I say religion, I'm speaking more broadly here, as I say. Uh, it can be a concept, an idea that can't be questioned other than a belief in God. But Christianity, Judaism, Islam, all have demonstrated over history that in fact they do make wars worse and education more difficult, and the rights and, and uh, available power of individuals lessened, and the rights of women reduced by these, all of these religions. When we uh, engage in war, it turns out that always, 
without exception, those people who are fighting on God's behalf and doing what God has told them to are in practice doing what some human being has told them God has said to do. It is a dangerous and difficult thing in this uh, universe and in this life uh, that supernatural beliefs get in the way of rational behavior. So that human being who claims to be speaking for God needs to be doubted and needs to be and, and generally will deter be determined, uh, not generally always, will be determined upon careful inspection only to be speaking for an idea, for power, for himself, etc. Great evil results from believing that if uh, a message is coming from God and therefore we cannot question it. Depending on human leaders who claim to be proceeding from ultimate authority demonstrably interferes with advances in human understanding, individuals or societies' understanding, and it curtails or even opposes scientific advances in understanding. The problem of evil, of suffering, it is incompatible, in, it, it does not work. You can't really make sense of the universe as a created, well-designed, intelligently produced universe and reconcile that with a vast amount of suffering. And I'm not just talking about the suffering of a sinner who does not follow the rules. I am talking about uh, a four-year-old girl in Piedmont, Alabama, who was in a church service with her mother, who was a, a Methodist preacher, and a tornado struck the church service on Palm Sunday during the church service, killed 20 people, including that four-year-old girl. Now, could it be that Allah was trying to punish those folks for worshiping in a Methodist church or for having a female pastor? I, I can't accept that. That doesn't make sense to me. Could it be that uh, this four-year-old uh, girl committed some terrible sin and deserved to die, or that her mother uh, did something terrible and deserved to have her daughter die in front of her? I can't, I can't believe that any of you would accept that. I certainly cannot accept it. And of course, that's a very small and isolated example. We have a few years ago a horrible tsunami that killed a quarter of a million people including more women and children probably than men. Uh, many, many innocent children, even unborn children, were killed in that tsunami. And another uh, example much more recently this year in Haiti, where uh, a couple of hundred thousand people were killed and many, many others injured and their lives ruined by an earthquake. Now, it is possible, I suppose, to believe in a God that would create that kind of disastrous, murderous, irrational pain. But it doesn't really make sense if you claim that the God you believe in, Allah or God, is a rational or an intelligent or a compassionate or a good, in, even in a limited sense, good God. That doesn't make sense. And you should apply philosophical uh, testing of that to see if it makes sense, and it does not. It's not just suffering that occurs because somebody's not following a moral standard. It is suffering that is overwhelmingly arbitrary, capricious, pointless. Now, if in fact a theist, Islamic or any other sort of theist, says to me, ah, oh, we, we these are, these are God's ways, they are not our ways. Uh, we're here in, in, uh, in England where the poet, uh, uh, it's spelled Cowper, but it's actually pronounced Cooper, said he works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. Uh, he hides his smiling face. Uh, I find every theist I've ever talked to, and there may be an exception tonight, argues there are many things we don't understand about what God did, and that's the explanation of suffering. Uh, it's beyond our ability to understand it. 
You have admitted that you cannot defend this concept of God if you think you cannot understand what you say he did in a particular case or allowed to happen in a particular case. Whether that's a tornado in Alabama or a tsunami in uh, Asia or a, a, an earthquake in Haiti. It is true that if Hamza Sorchitz uh, convinced me that Allah actually did do those things, that then I would question whether that, that God is worth worshiping or not. But that's not the point I'm making. I'm not saying I, I had a Catholic priest uh, in a debate with me earlier this year say, oh, well, the fact that Ed is asking these questions proves that he actually believes in God. He's just now he's trying to sort out what God's like and why he's so mean and stuff like that. And that's not true. It's the fact that these, this sort of a universe is incompatible with the idea of a God that leads me not to believe in God. I'm not mad at God. I don't think he's sadistic. I don't think he exists. There's a big difference. I mentioned uh, demography, not theology. And uh, I happen to be reading, or actually my wife was reading. I'll have to quit plagiarizing and admit. Uh, she was reading a New Yorker fictional story today. And she read out loud to me from this story uh, by somebody named Jonathan Foer, F-O-E-R. Isn't it funny that if God were to reveal and explain himself, the majority of the world would necessarily be disappointed? Now that means no matter what the God said or explained, the majority of the world does not agree on what God is like or what he wants or what he has commanded us to do. Actually, even the majority of Muslims don't agree on that, despite what my friend uh, may have said earlier. But certainly, Muslims and Baptists and Mormons and, and Buddhists and others don't agree. Demography, the, the uh, geography and culture combination that gives us statistics of how old people are and what their income is and where they live and that sort of thing, is a far better predictor of what people will believe than theology. Very, a very small percentage of the world's people believe what they believe because they have examined and, and carefully uh, discovered what the truth is. And that goes for atheists as well as it goes uh, uh, for Muslims and Christians and, and all the rest. Why is that important? It makes no sense if there actually is a God and if this God has infinite power to communicate and to command it makes no sense that there would be this vast disagreement among the world's people and that the prediction of what people do believe would be what did their parents believe, what did their grandparents believe. There are people who convert. I used to be a Christian, now I'm an atheist. Hamza Sorchis used to be, I don't know what he used to be, but he wasn't a Muslim. Christian, I don't know what your previous, it doesn't matter. I'll get back to talking to him later. Uh, People do convert, and people do examine uh, religious claims and religious beliefs intelligently, but that is very much the exception. And I congratulate all of you that you are here tonight, that you are, in fact, listening to more than one side about this, and I hope you are thinking about it. You shouldn't change your mind. Uh, the debate topic title says you decide. You shouldn't decide based on one debate. You need to do a lot of reading and thinking. But you need to read and think from the ones you disagree with, not just the ones you agree with. If you are Islamic, you should read Richard Dawkins, and you should read Christopher Hitchens, and you should read Sam Harris. You should read these people with as open a mind as you can. If you are, and I hope there are a few, uh, free thinkers and atheists in the crowd, you should read the works of uh, Hamza Zorchis. You should read uh, a variety of different religious views and test them systematically before you come to conclusions about this thing. It is, it is not to be taken lightly, and on that I think we seriously agree. Finally, I say there is no objective morality. And this is something that theists usually vigorously disagree with me on, whether it's Christians or Islamic or whoever. They insist there is some absolute standard of uh, behavior, and that was given to us in uh, revealed scripture, in the Quran, in the Holy Bible, in the Torah, 
in uh, uh, the Book of Mormon, etc. But we do not have any consistency in moral standards. Uh, Hamza Shortz has written that uh, we all object to uh, the Holocaust. Well, I certainly object to the Holocaust, and I agree with him about that. Uh, the wanton and, and pointless killing of uh, Jews and gypsies and atheists and homosexuals is, is obviously not an acceptable thing. And how do I know that it's not an acceptable thing if I don't believe in God? Because I do believe in human beings, and I do believe in individual human rights, and I do believe we have to construct the best moral standards we can, but they will never be an objective that is coming from outside of humanity and unchanging set of standards. And we know that human beings of all religions and all cultures have changed their moral standards. I'm not talking about their behavior and whether they meet the moral standards, but changed the standards over time and from one place to another. There are, despite claims to the contrary, serious inconsistencies within the Islamic world as to what is an acceptable moral standard on a particular case. You agree on many important things, but you don't all agree on all uh, moral standards. And there are differences, vast differences, between Christians and Islamic uh, followers, between uh, Jews and Christians, and so forth. And there are vast differences within Christianity. And these are on important questions, not on trivial things. There are differences uh, uh, in conclusion about what counts as murder, about what when abortion is acceptable, about whether capital punishment is desirable or acceptable, and on and, and what the role of war should be. Big things and little things get strong disagreement among human cultures, and that is not consistent with the idea of a, a, an intelligent and all-knowing uh, and all-powerful uh, creator of the universe. We do not have objective morality. It isn't even possible to reach it. We should certainly care about how we treat each other. I'm not saying morality is not important. I'm saying that we cannot have the kind of morality that you would expect to have if, in fact, we had a, 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 an Allah or an or a all-powerful being who was in charge of this and who could communicate with us. Uh, we'll talk some more about the Koran, although I don't know very much about it, I'll tell you quite uh, honestly. Uh, but whatever it is, we know there is not consistent communication from a God to all of humanity, because not even a majority of humanity agree on what the moral standard should be. And, there, and it's not just A versus B, there are thousands of possibilities and different ways of looking at this. To sum up, we have a duty to test for truth. There is no good reason to believe in any god. None of the gods on offer are coherent or objective. Religion makes human life worse overall. The appalling, pointless suffering, and I, by the way, I should have added not just human suffering. Uh, I mean, that cute little rabbit that gets eaten alive by the cougar is suffering. And none of us think, even those of you who are religious, that that rabbit has a chance to go to, to heaven. The, the problems with the answers to, the, the problem of evil is a very well-known problem. It is, uh, any response to it is called a theodicy, an explanation of why God would allow or create such things. And there are hundreds of them, but they all fail, including my opponents. Uh, the, dem the fact that demography determines uh, belief and that there is no objective, God-given uh, morality are the final reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ed Buckner, for that presentation. Um, I've done quite a few of these debates now with atheists and philosophers and although I don't like to be presumptuous but it always usually ends up in the same kind of way which is you know myself the Muslim someone who believes in a God and in, in a religion 
kind of with detailed arguments, trying to give some kind of logical and rational explanations to the justifications of the belief. Then you have on the other side, which I think, and I'm not saying that's because Dr. Ed Buckley is an atheist, but generally from my limited experience, is that you have this kind of wishy-washy generalizations about religion. And your first point was about the systematic test for truth. We have an epistemic duty, which means we have a, a duty to knowledge, if you like, that we have to investigate things. And it's quite interesting that Ed is preaching to us, sorry for the pun, that we should investigate things and you know, look into Richard Dawkins and buy Christopher Hitchens' book. But he even admitted that he hasn't read or known much about the Quran, which to me I think is uh, intellectual hypocrisy, if you like. If I can't use better terms, I do apologize. I'm stuck in this kind of theological paradigm. Yeah? So that's the first point. And the second point, it assumes that the atheist worldview has the yardstick for truth. And if we do read the Quran or we do read Islamic philosophy, it, the Quran always mentions yatafakkarun, for those who reflect, which comes from the word to think and to think deeply and to scratch the surface. And the thing that you're thinking about, you must inquire about its implications. That's why that root word is used 18 times throughout the whole of the Quran. So it invokes thinking. For example, the Quran also mentions things like, do you not reflect within yourselves? Pointing to the psychological and physiological dimensions of this micro universe, the small universe, which is the human being amongst the ma macro universe. So the first point, I think, is, is a good point, but it also applies to the Islamic worldview. The second point, you said there is no evidence in believing in a supernatural being. There is no coherent concept of God. You actually didn't tell us what that actually means. You just gave a statement, God doesn't exist because there is no coherent concept of God, full stop. I mean, I could sit here and say, you know, I'm half Chinese, half Jamaican. I could just make some claims like this, but you have to say why and show. I mean, we're here to have a debate. If you made a statement, which is quite general, you didn't give some kind of evidence for that. So bringing you back to the first point of an epistemic duty, you have a duty to tell us why God's concept, the concept of God, is not coherent in the first place. And maybe I could disagree with you when, once I hear some of your analysis. Also, you said there's no supernatural text or book that come, has come to us and said this, who God is. Well, I disagree. I think my second argument, which you haven't broken down and constructed an alternative argument, is that the Quran itself is best explained by it being a divine book, based upon the logical deduction that I announced to the masses today, something which you haven't addressed at all. Uh, and there are some criteria for a divine text. One, it must be logically consistent internally and externally. Two, it must have a signpost to the transcendent, which means it must have something that is beyond naturalistic explanation. That's why I use logical deduction to break it down for everybody. And also, that it must be logically compatible with the rational view on the basic definition of God. As I gave you the origins of the universe argument in the beginning, that God must be one, unique, immaterial, eternal, and personal. And this was based upon the conceptual analysis on who, on, on the cause of the universe, which, you, again, you never addressed any of these things. Then we went to your next point about belief and questioning and actually opposing science. Um, I would have to actually disagree with you because this is a European mentality, Doctor. The reason a European mentality because what happened in history, the Catholic Church was opposing any ideas that was incongruous with its worldview. And therefore you had oppression, you had the 30-year wars, and you probably discuss this later on Monday and Tuesday. However, the point I'm trying to make is Islam doesn't have the same historical baggage. We actually had a unique combination of politics and progress within a theological paradigm. This is why John W. Draper in the Intellectual Development of Europe, he actually says, I have to deplore the systematic manner in which the literature of Europe has continued to put out of sight our obligation to the Mohammedans. Surely they cannot no much longer be hidden. This is why you had Islamic scholars like Ibn Sina who wrote the Canon of Medicine which was used for 600 years in Western Europe. Have you had your tonsils out? Do you still have your tonsils? Uh, no. Well, I do still have them. Oh, you do? Well, many of us don't have tonsils. I don't have any tonsils. I remember eating lots of ice cream and watching Arnold Schwarzenegger Commando when I wasn't allowed to, lying on my uh, sofa when I was seven years old. And the reason I don't have them anymore is because, lo and behold, 500 years ago, an Islamic scholar developed 
the tool that we still use today, which is almost the same as 500 years ago. So this is a, I would argue, a European complex. You shouldn't superimpose it to the rest of the Islamic world, which I think is slightly unfair. Then you said religion is evil and outdated. Well, let me speak about this. The Regis Professor of Divinity at University of Oxford, Keith Ward, he says, it is very difficult to think of any organized human activity that could not be corrupted. The lesson is that anti-religious corruptions and religious corruptions are both possible. There is no magic system of belief, not even in the belief in liberal democracy, which can be guaranteed to prevent it. Another thing which I thought was an outdated cliche from the atheists was that religions cause war and evil. Well, let's hold our horses a bit, okay? 70 million people under Chairman Mao. That's a hell of a lot of people. Dead, by the way. 20 million people died under Stalin, 6 million of them being Christians. 2 million people no longer exist because of Pol Pot. 700,000 innocent Iraqis in the occupation. 500 Iraqi children in the 10-year sanctions. World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War. The mass murder of newborn baby girls in China, an irreligious state. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the ethnic cleansing of Tibetans, Palestinians, Chechens, etc. All done, not in the name of God, but in the name of irreligious, secular ideologies. So I think it's quite unfair for, 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 for that claim to come across. It's an outdated cliche, something that Richard Dawkins always pronounces. Um, and the other thing about human leaders, you say when human leaders have re religiosity, there's a problem. Well, I disagree with you. Maybe because, maybe Bush, but I think he was deluded. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make is, look at the Islamic history. I agree now, Islam is not implemented comprehensively in the Muslim world. But when you look into the past, we solved the problem of anti-Semitism. It was the Muslims. Now you have a secular, oppressive state. They don't know where to go. They're actually killing people in international waters, for God's sake. But what did the Muslims do? I mean, let's go read our history. What does Zion Zohar say? Zion Zohar is a contemporary Jewish historian. He said, and thus, when the Muslims crossed the Straits of Gibraltar and the Iberian Peninsula, the Jews saw them as liberators from Christian persecution. So you have a whole narrative of Jewish contemporary scholars saying, you know what? The solution, we need to look into our history. So we have an epistemic duty to read about Islamic history. Now, you also said about the problem of evil. And I think the problem of evil is actually a problem for the atheist. Because the problem of evil assumes moral properties. It assumes that evil is actually objective and real. And if that is the case, then God exists. I'll tell you why. Because God is the only ontological, the grounding for objective morality. So if you're assuming that evil is really true, then God must exist. Because there's nothing else in absence of God that provides that rational grounding. Well, you may say evolution and social pressure. Well, let's talk about these things. Evolution, what does it say? We're just accidental byproducts of a lengthy evolutionary process. Your morals, your belief that killing Jews is bad, actually has evolved just like your toenails and your teeth. This is why um, Michael Rule, the philosopher of science, he says morality is a biological adaptation no less our hands, feet, and teeth. And then he continues, morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. Now, if atheists really believe in the evolutionary paradigm, they should all practice polygamy. Because if it's all about aid and reproduction, then have more wives. Then you'd be true to your own beliefs. Then you won't be accusing the Muslims for doing the wrong things in the first place. Um, so let's go to social pressure. Can social pressure provide an objective grounding for morality? No, it can't, because what's social pressure? Social pressure differs and changes, and I agree with you. And this is why if social pressure is too, then we have to say actually that killing six million Jews is good if we agree with social pressure because there was a consensus at that time in the 1940s to kill six million Jews. So you've assumed moral properties here and I'm going to go in the Q&A more into why the problem of evil is actually a problem for the atheist and not for the theist. So my final point, I have one minute left, is that you're saying the majority of people actually Wherever they come from, it's more like they're going to have this belief. But what, ha what has that got to do with today's debate? If you study logic, that is called the genetic fallacy. And the genetic fallacy is to be suspicious of a belief just because where it came from. This has nothing to do with today. Today, we're both grown philosophical adults. So we could scrutinize intellectual worldviews and actually provide constructive arguments or deconstruct our own arguments. And Dr. Ed Buckner, I look forward to you doing that. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, first, I want to thank my opponent for proving that there is no God. Uh, I'm a little confused. I misunderstood. I thought that uh, rebuttal was supposed to be in the rebuttal, not in the opening talk, so it's odd that he uh, found it unconvincing that I didn't reply to some of his arguments in my opening talk. But I'll reply now. Uh, and I do appreciate the fact that he, uh, that he proved that there is no God. He uh, asserted repeatedly that there cannot be an infinite regress, that there has to be uh, always a cause for something or it doesn't exist. Uh, and yet he believes that God is the uncaused causer. Uh, so when we have the, uh, the drawing of the earth on top of the elephant, on top of the turtle, etc., he says, well, the first one is not the first one. There isn't a first one. Uh, it makes, it's a tautology. It makes no sense at all. It is just as reasonable, and it is the reason that I would suggest you do this. It's just as reasonable to believe that the universe is uncaused rather than that God is uncaused. Uh, was I there when the Big Bang happened? Do I understand the, uh, the chemistry and the physics? No. Uh, I'm not a cosmologist. But I do know that according to the cosmologists, there was no time and no space before that, and that there was nothing before that. So if you had nothing, why would you call that nothing God? And why would you insist that there has to be something at the end of the first infinite regression besides the universe and call that God? That is, that's a, uh, uh, an interesting trick. It's not a one that's original with Hamza, of course, uh, where you say there has to be something before everything, but there's nothing before God. If there has to be something before everything, then what caused God? What came before God? Did he exist in infinity? Well, he couldn't have because Hamza persuaded us that there is no such thing as infinity. And he went on to, uh, to prove it in a variety of ways and to say that we cannot get something from nothing. So where did God come from? God existed forever, according to the uh, uh, Islamic uh, belief. It's, it makes more sense to believe that the universe existed forever as far as time goes. And to deal with this infinite regression, uh, uh, as, as Hamza did, is a sleight of hand that actually doesn't show us anything. It was, I have to say, a, a bit intellectually dishonest of my opponent to say to act as if I had said that religion causes all wars, when I said no such thing, I said it makes wars worse, but they are caused by lots of different things. Sometimes religion is a major part of it, sometimes it's a minor part of the cause. He missed my point entirely in regards uh, to demography uh, in, in trying to uh, uh, convince you that I am uh, guilty of a genetic fallacy uh, I did not say that we should question Islam or any other religious belief because of who believes it. I said we should question whether it makes sense in a world where religious belief is so fragmented and so predicted by geography and culture, whether or not religion ev evolved culturally or whether it uh, was produced because there is a God. My argument is not that we should believe there is no God because different people have different uh, uh, geographical connections, but that that is evidence that we don't have the, uh, divine design, that we don't have the sort of consistency you would expect if you had a God who could communicate. Now, uh, my opponent was uh, quick to say that uh, uh, I uh, neglected his claims about the Quran. And I told you, I'm not an expert on, on uh, Islam, and I know only superficial knowledge of it. Uh, if, it if, if I read the Quran, I don't read any Arabic, so I'd have to read an inferior English translation. If I read the Quran and was convinced of the things that he says, you know, I'm open to changing my mind. And I would argue that if you are not open to changing your mind, you are intellectually dishonest. Uh, so. Ask yourself, are you in fact capable of deciding that Islam is not uh, the way, the truth, etc.? Uh, the, 
It is a common fallacy to say of atheists, and for that matter of some others who accept evolutionary theory, that uh, that means they should give up any kind of uh, morality and uh, work hard to produce as many children as possible. It's entirely possible to have a belief in a biological explanation and not believe that that is the best way for humankind to proceed. Uh, it, we are civilized. We are, have a culture. If, there's no question Islam has contributed to that. I certainly don't deny that, and I don't understand why if I say to you religion has done more harm than good, and that includes Islam, that providing me with an example of some good that Islam has done counters that argument. It doesn't. I, I never said, never hinted that I didn't think Islam was successful in helping us to preserve Western civilization. There's no question that Islam did that. There is no question that all of the religions I know anything about have, in, and all of the religious individuals I know anything about, have made contributions, positive contributions. But overall, in the long run, religion impedes our thirst for knowledge by fixing things and saying that things cannot be investigated. Islam has contributed to our understanding of why I still have my tonsils. No argument about that. I have no question at all that there have been and still are, and, and will be probably for as long as there is a religion, uh, successful Islamic scientists and doctors. Uh, and that, does, that has nothing to do with the point I was making. Uh, if, if you accept the Book of Mormon and the revelations that came to Joseph Smith uh, because you haven't yet read those and understood them, then maybe you and I will have something to talk about, the fact that I'm not as familiar with the Quran. Every religion that I know that I do know about insists that its sacred book, its word straight from God, has qualities that make it self-proving. Uh, these arguments always ultimately come down to some sort of circular argument, some sort of begging the question, where you believe to begin with that it is a sacred book that comes from God, and then you look and find incredible, impossible to imagine verses in a particular order. Uh, some guy who's done one with numerology on the, on the uh, Jewish and Christian Bible, and, and it's, it's astonishing. You find what you're looking for if you make up your mind to look for things. So I have no doubt that there are scholars who are Islamic who, who think the Quran is evidence that uh, it's a signpost to the divine. But I do know as well that most of the uh, scholars, the critics, who have looked at it find no such thing. I mean, all the way back to Edward Gibbon, who found it to be a dull and uninteresting book. Uh, I haven't read it myself. I, you know, as soon as I do, then uh, we'll come back and we'll talk about how much we agree on all of this. But at that time, I will also want to know uh, your take on Joseph Smith. I assume you've investigated that with him. So it's a later revelation with a prophet, gold, gold things. And it, the, the pro protagonist in favor of the Latter-day Saints will, in, will assure you that it is clearly a sacred book and that the internal evidence proves it doesn't work for me. If it works for you, then uh, maybe uh, you can win me over in this debate. Thanks. about the Quran because I haven't read it yet. So you have to be convinced about the Book of Mormon, yes? You need to listen a bit more carefully. He said, have you read the Book of Mormon and you believe it's a relation of God? I'm answering your second question. Oh, good. So I have read the Book of Mormon and I don't believe it's a relation of God. Why is that? That's what What about it convinces you? Okay, what convinces me, and see, I think 
you need to be attentive to my arguments. Because you know, and I'm going to give you an example why I think you're not being attentive to my arguments. Well, you've been very inattentive to mine. So well, yeah. that's fine, that's fine. But you can tell me why that's the case. The reason you're into my arguments, for example, you gave me the infinite regress uh, philosophy. Yeah? If you were attentive to the logic, logic of my arguments, whatever begins to exist as a cause. Now, God never began to exist, so therefore the infinite regress doesn't apply to God, even from logic, and I assume you've studied some logic. Significantly, if you say, what caused the cause that caused the universe, then we'll be saying, then, what caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? Wait a minute, let's carry on. Then what caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? And you can do that in penance, I mean, if that's the case, then we never had creation in the first place. So that's the rebuttal to that very simple uh, analysis of my argument. And that's why you haven't been into my argument. And if you did, you would have known that I give you criteria for divine revelation. Yeah. One, it must be consistent internally and externally. For example, if the Quran said the earth yeah, is personal. the earth is di diagonal, yeah? And it's a funny shape, but underneath it is an octopus with like eight kind of Funny things. Yeah? Well, I'm always. Yeah, exactly. So uh, obviously that's externally consistent. Also, must be internally consistent. You can't say on page one explicitly there is no God, and on page two saying there is a God. That's you can't reconcile. It's an irreconcilable difference. And thirdly, and most significantly, it must have a sign to the transcendent, which means what? Which means you can use two types of like thinking. Like the Mormon, right? Well, we're going to discuss that later. Um, I thought you were atheist. Now, <laughs> the, the point I'm trying to make is this, is that firstly, you, if you use logical deduction, you come to the conclusion that, you know what, we've used all naturalistic explanations, we can't explain the Qur'an. One. Secondly, when we look at philosophy or the philosophy of miracles, which is defined as an event that lies outside the productive capacity of nature, which means you can't exhaust, even if you were to exhaust all the finite letters and grammar of the Arabic language, you could never produce its style, feature, etc. So that is a sign force to the transcendent because we can't find naturalistic explanations. If you don't apply that criteria, in my opinion, to any given book today, it would not apply. And this is why I would say to you, I believe in the Quran based upon this criteria. If you have alternative so criteria... anyone who has studied the Quran would be convinced of this, yes? No, because obviously we're not robots and some people have egos or some people have some pride. Some people are convinced before they start in one Sorry. direction or the other. Well, the interesting thing is you're talking to someone who was unconvinced and then became convinced. So from my personal perspective, I was a skeptic, I was unconvinced. Funny enough, president of the American atheist, I was a secular humanist, uh, which is something that you've been a chairperson of, I believe. Um, so I came away from that because I think it was our systemic duty to actually look into my life and the universe and come to some conclusions. And the current conclusion I have is that Islam is the most correct view based upon its intellectual foundations. The existence of God, the miraculous nature of the Quran, its inimitability, and the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is something which you haven't addressed yet. What is the penalty for changing your mind in either direction about the truth of Islam, and what should it be? Well, okay. well I know it's a bit rude to answer a question with a question, but I'll do both. What is the penalty for a nation under the secular capitalism for changing its regime that's not in line with current American hegemony? It's actually death of like half a million Iraqi babies, right? No. Isn't I it? Agree you don't that. Think so? I wouldn't agree that. I, so, I, you I, I so you haven't heard of something called liberal interventionism? Of course I have. I, so I am, maybe you should ask me your question, so in your more family, it would, family, it would, it would be interesting if I could comment on your comments. So. It would be interesting if I were allowed to comment on your comments. Yeah, please. But I, uh, I certainly think the, uh, the adventure in Iraq was a horrible mistake, and I thought so before it started. So, you know, it's not a question of do I agree with American But why is it policy. horrible if there's no objective morality? Uh, I mean, he's well, there's another question there. You are uh, the one who has no uh, objective morality available to you, and this is demonstrable because of the record of Islam, for example, on the question of slavery. Surely, uh, something that most modern uh, people, including most modern Muslims, think is an immoral thing to do. do. But it has not been uh, the case throughout the history of Islam. Uh, Muslims have, have taken many, many uh, uh, people as slaves and justified it. Uh, and so, of course, all other religious groups. Moral standards change. 
They change not, I'm not talking about people don't obey the moral standard, I'm talking about what they think is right changes. I agree with you. But the argument is not about moral epistemology. It's, it's not about the fact that we don't have any morality sure, you can outside of human beings. The argument is not about moral epistemology, which basically means it's not about how we get to know morality. Okay? In Islam, we have this ikhtilaf, a differencing of opinions. So did God really say this or did he say that? The point I'm trying to make is about moral ontology, the actual grounding for morality as a moral property. So we would say, no, there are objective morals. Okay, that's fine. You but you're, you're conflating ontology with epistemology. And I'm saying to you, fine, I agree there's differences of opinion. But the point is, I'm saying once you have a conviction, the grounding for that is always objective because objective morality makes sense of the existence of God. And we believe in moral properties. Now, for you to have claims of point the finger at the Islamic worldview or Islamic history, actually presumes moral properties. And if you do presume moral properties, then what is your grounding for that? And if your grounding is not God, then it's all relative anyway. You can't say nothing about what happened in Iraq, or nothing that happened in Germany, or nothing that happened anywhere well, else. That's absurd, and I've already explained that it Why is it absurd? absurd. Because you can uh, ground uh, morality, not in a complete objective uh, fashion, but you can ground it on human values, on the fact that human suffering uh, should be avoided, and, and that we should uh, uh, do no harm uh, to our fellow human beings, uh, no unnecessary harm. And that, of course, leads to all sorts of problems. It, it comes down to who has the most power to make the definitions, and terrible things have happened throughout human history because of this. So I don't, I'm not trying to say that there is a clear objective standard for morality and that there isn't. I'm saying there isn't one, that we have to do the best we can and that the fact that there is no ultimate moral grounding, objective grounding for our moral standards, doesn't mean we shouldn't have moral standards. I of course we should. We should have moral standards. We should care about how we treat our fellow human beings. We should oppose the Holocaust. We should oppose racism. We should oppose okay, just the oppression of women. That. But we have to do that without having an objective moral standard because there isn't one. Okay, that's your presupposition, and it's invalid because you haven't dealt with the claim that the Quran is inimitable and is a miracle. But that means you're claiming that morality, its basis is social pressure. If that's the case, then in America... It's far more complicated than that. Well, that's the starting point. And therefore, in America, in maybe 200 years' time, or 100 years' time, or 50 years' time, it would be okay for old men to actually sleep with three-year-old boys. There's actually an organization called Nambu. It could happen. America. I think it's unlikely, as my... Well, it's unlikely, but... but I, hope it does not. I mean, my grandmother thought some things that happened today are unlikely, but they happened very fast and very quick. So this is the problem with the atheistic worldviews. But you're already no, no, married. That's the problem with your problem. That's the problem with your let problem. Me, let, me with statement. Statement. let me finish my statement. Thank you. Um, you the, the, the issue of slavery and apostasy in Islam, these are red herrings. You have agreed, and I assume you agree, that we base our decisions on reason and thinking and the rational foundations of our world view. Now, I agree that we should. The red herring is all those slavery in Islam, which is a little bit intellectually dishonest because slavery in Islam doesn't have a linguistic mirror in the Western narrative. When we mean slavery, we mean someone is able to become a ruler. And that happened in Islam. He was a son of a slave and he became a ruler. That's never happened in Islamic, in, in Western slavery. Furthermore, the Quran itself says to free slaves and to free an egg. So the concept and paradigm of slavery in Islam is actually one that goes towards stopping slavery in the first place. So what happened, for example, when the Americans took all the blacks? That was actually against international law at that time. And what was international law? It was Islam. It was Islam, you shouldn't be doing this. Now, whether Muslims actually sold slaves to the West is another different issue. But the point is, you really know what, Why is that? what, what does slavery mean from the Islamic paradigm? But the point is, that's a red herring. The point is, that doesn't negate your existence. It doesn't negate the fact that the Quran is a miracle and inimitable, and it doesn't negate the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These are like red herrings coming from left field. What it, I mean, it's not a red herring at all. It negates the fact that there is or ever has been an objective standard, which is what you would expect if there was a God. But in fact, the standards change. They change in the history of Islam. You misunderstood again. In the epistemology with ontology, how we get to the basic argument of it. Okay, Dr. Ed Buckman, you agree that there was a difference between the basis of morality and how we get to know more. So yes. ontology and epistemology. Yes. But we're arguing two different things. I agree with you that when we look at particular texts, we can come to different conclusions. I agree. But I'm saying. 
is that whatever conclusion we find, it is from a particular text. That grounding is objective because it's come from the divine. That's the point I'm making, which is an ontological claim. Well, I'm, I'm, I, you know, we, we seriously disagree. There is no grounding. And, uh, you know, it's not that I... Okay, good. Pay attention to the question. We're well, having some grounding. There is no grounding. Okay, let's work on that. Let's work there on that. is no ultimate grounding. Yes, let's have a conversation now. This is the conversation. Let's start in a positive way. There is no grounding. I'm claiming there is a grounding. And I'm saying this book of the Quran can have come from an Arab, a non-Arab, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or the Divine. And that's you convinced convince the convinced, and you have already said it, and I no, have heard that, it. No, that again is, 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 is not really nice, because you know I've come from a certain worldview, and I've adopted another one based upon reason and intellectual activity. For example, you asked me if I read the Book of Mormons, I have, I've read the Quran, you've come debating Islam and atheism, you haven't read the Quran yourself. I mean, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's and, I'm, and I know the flight's about 10 because hours. It's dishonest of you to say I didn't even need to know anything about uh, Islam in order to have this debate. You were the one that told me that. No, I didn't say that. Yeah, did I have the email? Well, 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 I'm a believer. You don't have to be everything I say. Yeah. I'm a Muslim. Yeah. Into the day. <laughs> you believe in God, but you're not one. Okay. Uh, I believe in God, but I'm not one. Well, obviously, I'm not what you just said. No, no. Uh, anyway, let's get something more productive. <laughs> Uh, so that's the point. Let's go to the other point, because what we need to do about contentions and, 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 our, and our worldview. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, was he a liar? Was he deluded? Was he both? Was he speaking the truth? I mean, for you, as I said, to actually show that atheism is the way forward, for example, you're very almost preachy like saying you must be an atheist. That's the logical and epistemic view. This is, you should be an atheist if you're open minded. And I'm, I'm saying to you, fact, if you're open minded, then you will be able to deconstruct my arguments and con construct new ones for the atheist worldview. At the moment, you haven't deconstructed my arguments, specifically the Quran and the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If you can't do that, then all you can say is, this is why I'm an atheist, I haven't said nothing about Islam, and there you go. But since the debate is about Islam or atheism, we decide, I am assuming you come ready, prepared, or you could even think about them now, um, I think we're finishing in about an hour anyway, so we've got plenty of time, that you could start deconstructing some of the rational deduction, logical deduction of the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and of the miracle of the Lord. Just to interject, there's one minute left, so please wrap up the discussion, we have one minute left for this. One minute. One minute. Sorry, I didn't hear it. Uh, I have uh, given you some deconstruction of that, which you've ignored. Okay. I accept that every sacred book and every religion always every one of them claims that their sacred book has characteristics that make it evident that it is divine. Okay. You don't accept these others, and they, they don't accept yours. Okay. That is evidence that in fact... Don't, don't take no it hard And uh, again, listening is, is critical in positive debates. Let me tell you why. I, I have told you what my criteria are for a text to be from the divine, which were logically posterior to me even reading the Qur'an. It was logically before when you read the Quran. These are my, my criteria. Similarly, what you've done, you fall into a logical fallacy again. It's a fallacious claim. You're saying, just because generally all religions are like this, therefore, I haven't read the Quran, but the Quran must be like that. That I is a logical claim. Yeah. I said if I read Dr. Ed, let me, let let me finish. That would be. I have said, you take many, something. many, many people have read the Quran and not come to that conclusion. Okay. Even more. But we're worried about yeah. your conclusions. Secondly, what we have to understand is this, is that you can't take a thing in general and make it specific. This is well known in any type of Hellenistic logic. Uh, and I, and I something that, that we, need to be, we need to be careful about because we could be intellectually dishonest to the audience because uh, you're saying, here's a generality, let's superimpose on something specific, something which doesn't no, make I'm sense saying, logic. I am saying very specifically that uh, there is very, very good evidence uh, to believe that there is no... You didn't say that. You're saying two different things are. First, you're saying... Because other religions have these claims. Now you're saying there is very good evidence. And, and a variety of arguments. I think you need, I think you need to make your mind up. No, I think you need to make your mind up. And what's very interesting is... I, I have made my mind up pretty well. I think your claim should be that I've made it up too well. Dr. Edward, I think... Wouldn't you say it's a bit more honest to say, you know what, guys? I've never read the Quran. I haven't analyzed Hamza's criteria for divine text. When I do that, I'll get back to you. Wouldn't that be I a bit more sincere? That's what I said with regard to that argument. Wouldn't that be, be a bit more sincere? Uh, that's exactly what I said, so yes. Well, you said sincere. three things now. First, you said there's good arguments. Then you say the, the, other the, religions have done it. Your first and argument, now you're saying, uh, I'm being your sincere. Your first argument was in favor of my position. 
Your second argument and your third argument were things with which I'm not sufficiently familiar in the specific case of the Grand Islam to And I didn't pretend that I could. But I did say that in general, when we find religious claims like that, they consistently, all of them, say that. Now, how many religions must I examine before I realize that they are all like that? All of them to be 100 percent. All we need to do is identify the criteria for revelation, something which you haven't tried. Okay, let's wrap this up, gentlemen. Gentlemen, it's now over to you, the audience. We are going to have a question and answer session now. There are two microphones in the aisles. Um, we invite you to queue up. Um, people can also send in questions via paper. And uh, we will take the microphones alternately. So we are now going to have a question and answer session where you can address uh, any of the participants of the debate tonight or you need both of them. So uh, please, uh, please queue up and we will take the first question from my right shortly. Right, we'll uh, uh, commence with the question and answer session now. Yes, the gentleman on my right over there. Right, thank you. And uh, this be a point on the British and sisters. I've just got um, some questions to clarify. Hopefully I can get a calm and logical answer um, for all our open, or educated audience to come here. I'd just like to clarify, um, I would like you guys, if possible, to really clarify, assume as I've done this, yeah? Um, we provide such thing, um, answers and logical ones about the existence of um, the universe, this physical universe. I think Dr. Uh, Brother Hamza has uh, mentioned it quite clear from his perspective on um, the finite, the physical um, 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 starting point of uh, our um, universe. Um, but, and, and I'm sure you guys have agreed earlier that um, the um, um, the, the universe started from nothing, and um, Dr. Hamza was, um, sorry, Brother Hamza was um, pointing out how could nothing um, produce nothing, and there must be an uh, extra physical, um, which uh, the potentiality of nothing is there. Um, but, but just please, um, Dr. Ed, if you could uh, uh, explain um, in logical manner how this nothing could create something just immensely what we've seen today. Thank you. I, I heard very little of your question. I heard a little, and I think I can answer at least the last part based on what I heard. But either you should stand by or maybe you can help me with this question. The, the, the last part which I did hear is, you know, how could nothing have come from nothing? Uh, and how do I explain that? Uh, I, I accept the cosmologist's explanation that we had the Big Bang, that there was nothing before that, and that we actually know nothing. I mean nothing about what was before that, because there was no time or space before that. We have no knowledge about it at all. We can, and many theists do, uh, decide that we will call that nothing God. We can do as uh, uh, Hamza Tortoise uh, did, and, and use uh, the first cause argument, and say there must have been a cause, and therefore we'll call it God. But that is illogical to make that, that is no more an argument for God than my saying the universe must have existed until the Big Bang, and before that there was nothing, and there is no cause. If you accept his argument that there has to have been a God, then the same things that led him to say that would lead you to say, okay, what caused God? What, when, did, when did God start existing? If it's not eternal? If we cannot have an infinite regress, we can't have causes causing causes, you have to stop somewhere. That is no reason to say, therefore, we have to stop with a step beyond our understanding and call that God or Allah. It, it, what you say is, look, before the beginning or before the start of the universe, we don't know. But saying we don't know, is not the, that's not evidence for God. That just means we don't know. And if the first cause argument breaks down, 
if you apply it to God, so apply it instead to the universe. The universe is the first cause of everything we see here today. And the physical constants and pressures and, and processes uh, that led to what has what we are. I don't know if I answered the first part of I really didn't hear most of it. So just, that, so, so, just one short answer, I yes or no. Do you think nothing can lead to something? I did yes or no? Just to make it... I, I think in the... Uh, Obviously, we had, at the beginning of the universe, something coming from nothing, uh, or from nothing that we know anything about. Yes? Okay, I mean, yeah, okay. I think we could yeah, respond yeah, to each question. Yeah, it's 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 like, I mean, don't take a button again, the listening. I, I haven't given you a first cause argument. I'm giving you an argument the following way. Whatever begins to exist as a cause, that premise you cannot deny. If a pink elephant popped right next to me, and I said this came out of nothing, then, well, it came out of So what calls well, God? Well, listen to, I'm going to answer that question. What's very interesting as well is this, is that if we follow your philosophy of that things can come out of nothing, then there is no point even having a conversation. Do you know why? Because I can claim anything. You know what? Oh my God. My mother isn't my mother. She's actually a grey rhino that was born on Pluto, and she flew here in a giant feather. That would surprise me. <laughs> So it's very humorous, but it's not much of an argument. Dr. Buckner, I'd like to remind you that uh, Hunter does boxing and martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is... But well, that's his mother. <laughs> two... Okay, let me just finish the question. I think two mama cusses is too much for him. So I think I have to put a stop to that. So the point I'm trying to make is this, is that if we go down your route, then we can't have science, we can't have philosophy, we can't have logic. No point opening a bank, no point living, no point discussing, no point se searching for truth. So we can't go down that route because it's contradictory and it goes against things that we already know to be true. Now you said what That's caused That's obviously not true. Now you said what caused God. But the question here is not even about causality, it's whatever begins to exist as a cause. We're saying God never began to exist by concept and by principle. And if we just say then what caused God, well let's ask the question, then what caused the cause that caused God? Now, if we do that ad infinitum, then there's no God, and there's no creation. So, by rational necessity, it's telling us there's a cause. And I'm not saying now, and again, listening is very important. I'm not saying now, there's a cause for the universe, therefore it must be God. I even mentioned that. How do we know it's Allah? How do we know it's Jesus? How do we know who this thing is? I said, upon something called conceptual analysis, we come to the conclusion it must be one, eternal, unique, immaterial, and personal. And this is why it's unfair to say, oh, it's the prime mover, prime, prime mover argument, it's the first cause argument. I've given you the reasons why that's not the case. No, so let's pay let's it's attention. The same argument. Well, it's oh. not. How is it the same argument? Explain to me. Okay, no, I think we've okay. allowed each uh, speaker to have a crack at that question. Can we take a question from that side, please? Yes, sir. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I just want to point to something that hasn't been addressed yet by Brother Hamza. Um, Dr. Ed Buckman mentioned that um, because Allah has many names and many attributes, that therefore is contradictory. Yeah. So if I were to say that you, Sir Ed Buckner, is someone who is calm but then can be angered, somebody who is who is um, generous but then somebody who can be spiteful, all these attributes can be part of your character, but that doesn't mean that therefore does not mean that you are not Ed Buckner. It is not contradictory to yourself. It is. It is not contradictory, of course, to say that a, a character, whether Ed Butner or God, not quite the equivalent, but uh, any, any individual or character can have complex characteristics be one thing at one time and one thing another. And that was not the point that I was saying is contradictory. I remember this was in regard to the problem of evil, the problem of suffering. This is, it, it, uh, Hamza has said in his writing that, that uh, this is not a problem because God has many faces, because there are many different names for Allah. But I don't think that Islam, except as one of the names for Allah, uh, capricious and pointless killer of children. And yet in the uh, tsunami of 250,000 dead, thousands and thousands of children were killed pointlessly. That is not consistent with a God, a good God, a bad God, or a God with many names. That was my point. This also shows the difference between the atheist worldview and the Islamic worldview. Let's, let me give you a scenario. The atheist worldview is as follows. You have a crap life in a crap existence, being very poor, a tsunami comes, you drown and you die. Atheist worldview. That's it. 
Islamic worldview, you have a bad existence, you have no money, a tsunami comes, you drown, you die, and oh, here's eternal bliss. I'm not saying which one. You, you can characterize the Islamic point of view, but you did not correctly characterize the atheist point of view. Well, in fairness, you, you, you characterize my own mother, so I could do what I like. And <laughs> no, you didn't characterize that. So basically, I don't like when people don't characterize my views yeah. and then claim they have. Okay, my view of the atheistic point of view. And the point is, well, I think you misread my article, which is quite interesting. You actually read my article. Um, but you should read the Quran first next time, yeah? Uh, the point I'm trying to make is this, is that we believe that God has, a, has many names and attributes. And one of the names and attributes is that He's the wise. Now, He's what? He's the wise. The wise. There's wisdom in things. Now, you may say, well, I can't see the wisdom. Ha! Huh? But that's a logical fallacy. It's called an argument from ignorance. Just because you can't see something, it doesn't mean necessarily it actually solves a problem. So philosophically, logically, we solve the logical problem of evil, and it's not a problem. We say, God is all wise. If you can't see the wisdom, just be, it doesn't mean it's not there. I suggest everyone, Muslims and non-Muslims, to read a very interesting chapter of the Qur'an, which is chapter 18 of the Qur'an, that has an amazing narrative between Moses, peace and blessed be upon him, and this personality called Khidr. And they have this amazing narrative going on about the wisdom of God. And if you read it, I think it solves the problem of evil from the point of view that God is also all wise. But there's other, many, many other reasons why we believe the problem of evil is not actually a problem. Uh, because we believe people who drown, they have eternal bliss. We believe people who are buried under rubble, they have eternal bliss. Anyone who has uh, illnesses from the stomach have eternal bliss. To the point when they're in this bliss, they'll look back and say, I will do it again to be in this state. Do you see? Um, but from the logical I see that you believe that, I understand that Islam um, yeah, of course. Muslims and believe that, but that's not evidence for its truth. And, I, well, I and the point I was making is that you have a reality which is inconsistent with the designer God. You have a reality that you would get if, in fact, these things evolve. Biological evolution, the uh, evolution of, of the universe, the breaking up of planets, spinning off, and so forth. You have physical forces that do terribly destructive things that obviously don't care about human beings. I, I'm not trying to say that, that uh, your God is evil and goes around killing little kids. I'm trying to say that the natural forces are, goes around, go around killing little well, kids very, and, and that that's inconsistent with the existence of any God. No, it's not. It's, it's inconsistent. It is whether you say it is or not. Well, well, that's fine. You can speak by yourself. But the thing is, let me give you my perspective. It's inconsistent if you believe God is just good. Muslims don't believe God is just good. If it's just good, like many, I know Christian theology has developed a lot now, but many in the past, they thought God is just love. I don't see much love, therefore, oh my God, what's the problem? We're saying we have a little bit more of a comprehensive view on who God is. He's the just, he's the kind, he's the wise, he's the one who punishes, etc., etc. And these are reconcilable concepts that deal with reality. He's, you're, you're he's the position. one who kills several hundred thousand people and we can't understand anything about why. But, no. So well, that makes him... See, there's a difference. Somebody if you don't understand why, it doesn't negate existence. Again, that's a logical fallacy. It argument of ignorance. It, it, it just because... the basis for believing that it makes sense to believe in a God. No, no, no. Don't, uh, don't You are conflating from an existence of something, again, ontology to finding out things about something. So you always complain between ontology and epistemology. I'm, I'm saying you're doing that to find out something about like God. Like a boat on a very dodgy ocean. God makes no sense. Okay, I think, I think, I think, I think that's why. Let's move forward. Yeah, let's move forward. Let's uh, uh, question from that side, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And good evening to all. My name is Firdaus. I'm, I'm a Muslim in faith. I'm from Malaysia. Uh, I have a question to both of you. Uh, what if you are wrong? I repeat, what if you are wrong? Okay. And uh, specifically to Brother Dr. Ek, I have a Quran for you as a symbol of friendship. Don't yeah. go wrong, Quran. I have to read on the page. I'm giving you a copy of the Quran. So, have a copy of the Quran. So, now you can read it twice. <laughs> Right, so first of all, that question which is regarding what if you're wrong, let, let Hamza do the first one, that one. What if you're wrong? This is equivalent of what I'm with Pascal's wager. He's saying you should be someone who believes in a religion because, you know, 
the consequences of believing that are tremendous. Um, I think the question is wrong as well because the question assumes relativism and skepticism and something that I don't really think is a valid worldview that you may be right, you may be wrong, uh, it's all relative, there is no real truth. Uh, so I don't agree with the, the philosophy behind that question, but just to entertain it, if I'm wrong, then it's fine. If he's wrong, he's in trouble. <laughs> There are a number of reasons why there are problems with Pascal's wager, and you should be not, you should stop when you had finished rejecting it and not repeat it, uh, getting the, the one from the it's audience. Uh, in fact, what if you are wrong implies there are only two possibilities, and there are thousands. There are thousands of religions in the world, and many of those religions will insist that you believe their particular view, or else you go to hell. Now, Pascal's wager makes no sense on that ground. It also makes no sense on the ground that you can't force yourself to accept something that doesn't make any sense to you, that you think that is not well supported, even if you think there are consequences. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know about Islam. I know in, term, in Christian terms, their beliefs are that God can read your mind and knows what you're thinking. So pretending you believe when you really don't doesn't help you. You've got to actually believe. I suspect the same thing is true for Islam. Uh, so I can't actually believe unless I've got some good reasons to it. I haven't seen any. And the fact that I haven't read this book should not give you much hope because I've read lots of holy books and they haven't been successful in uh, persuading me. So Pascal's wager fa fails on so many different subjects. One, my favorite is, and this is a pos as much a possibility as the others, Imagine that there is a God, we can call her a female just to make it interesting. There's a female God who wants in her heaven with her only people who are intelligent enough to reject the inadequate evidence that she has provided. So only atheists go to heaven and all of the believers go elsewhere. Now, I don't believe that. I'm not saying I do. It's not a supportable uh, belief, but it's just as well supported as any other variation of Pascal's wager. So if, if and, and a more serious answer to the Pascal's wager question is, if, I, if he is wrong, then he has wasted a great deal of his obvious talent as a speaker and his considerable uh, energy and, and time and education pursuing a will of the wisp that will carry him nowhere. Uh, Islam has some value. I, I told you at the very beginning of my first talk that uh, is, Islam has uh, a reputation for being hospitable and friendly and gracious. Uh, so if in fact that religion or that combination of culture and religion succeeds in making you hospitable people and being good to each other, that's a great thing and I'm in favor of it. But there is no two choices that you have to make the right one or you go to hell and I don't think a serious Muslim would believe that either. Yeah, you're right. Okay, let's take a Let's take another question on this side. Yes, yes, sister. Hello, Salam Alaikum. Good evening. Why is um, I just wanted to know, um, because you haven't really offered us like an alternative point of view, um, I really want to know um, what your ideology is, what you think the person, purpose of existence is, and what the point of your life is. Well, I don't think there is any point to our existence if by that you mean external to human beings, if you mean ultimate, if you mean where we are finally going in the long run. I don't think there is any such, there is no answer to that. I believe that uh, life is arbitrary and capricious and meaningless from a point of view outside of human society. But I think that what matters is our view inside, the subjective view, and I think it's very important that we treat each other well, that we live a good, rich life. I, I said much earlier that I disagreed with Hamza's characterization of what I think uh, the atheist view of life is. Uh, and I think the atheist view of life is you only get one, you better do it right. And the way you do it right is to pay attention to your fellow man, be respectful of your fellow man, be interested in your fellow man, my fellow woman's ideas, principles, that you be gracious, that you be hospitable, 
Well, I am very much a, uh, a secular humanist as well as an atheist. Why? But why? Why? Because that gives me a richer, fuller life and those that I have come to love and care about a richer, fuller life. And human life is worthwhile and, and valuable and worth protecting and interesting from the subjective point of view of human beings. You do have to start with a principle or two and you have to accept those principles, but you can't expect them to be absolute grounding that, that won't work. You start with the principle that you should do no unnecessary harm, uh, as, as the Christians put it, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And there are variations of that in every human, almost every human culture we know anything about. Uh, in uh, Confucian China, and I, I'm sure there is in Islam as well. I'm just going to be very quick on, on just my 10 cents on that. And when you mentioned about you know, Islam mixed with culture, may, may have some good things, um, etc. I think that's quite unfair. I mean, atheists can be good people, so can humanists. But I would argue, since there's no moral driving force, no moral motivation, you're less likely to be. And that's actually not just an outdated cliche coming from the religious masses, because before the Christians and the Muslims would be like, you're an atheist, you're a bad person. But that's not really true, and I agree with that, because Dr. Ed Buckner, besides the fact that he abuses my, cusses my mother, uh, is still a really nice guy. Um, for example, in 2000, political scientist and professor Robert Putnam, he surveyed 200 volunteer organizations, and it showed that there was a positive correlation between religiosity and membership to these philanthropic organizations. This is why the index of global philanthropy says religious people are more charitable than non-religious, not only given to their own congregations, but also regardless of income, region, social class, and other demographic variables. And I think the reason for this is not an accident, because there's a positive correlation, is because there's a moral driving force, something that the sister was talking about, and purpose. And to add to the purpose, I mean, we attribute purpose to the most ridiculous things, like moths and insects. For example, there's a particular moth that its job is to eat the excrement of a moth above it when it's drinking the sap of a particular tree. Now, if there was moth genocide and we killed six million moths, we wouldn't really care. But we attribute it purpose, which is almost like the toilet of the first moth. But we want to attribute something purpose to ourselves that's more dynamic and has something uh, more creative. And, you know, from the atheist position, we could infer, and I think we can, that we're just on the sinking ship. We're on the Titanic, aren't we? Because the universe is going to die out one day. It's going to suffer heat death. Nothing's going to happen, so we're on the Titanic. What's the point of reshuffling the deck chair or shaking the hand of an old woman or giving her a glass of milk or whatever she drinks? But the point is, you is there... No, but let me make the point. You could argue when I've made the point. So it's clearly a fallacy in that you are... I have to make the point. Only if there's an ultimate purpose can we care about each other. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But when you, when you reduce it to relative... You don't have one life, you have to... Right. Yes, but when you have relative purpose, the issue is when someone could decide to have a purpose to basically, I have one life, I want it to be full and rich, well let me steal, let me eat as much as I can, let me be like certain hegemonic empires, take all the resources, give none to no one else, and we have something called, which I call, atheist capitalism in a way, which has this world view that a very minority would have all the resources, and most of the world, like 2 billion people on the planet, don't even have sanitation and food and water. I mean, this is a disgrace. And I would argue because there is no moral motivation. I agree with you, with your stance on relative purpose, but if you don't have moral motivation, you're going to have the state of affairs that we have today. Okay, there's quite a few people on this side, so I'll take a question on this side again. Yes, brother. Uh, thank you to both speakers. I really enjoyed the debate. I really enjoyed listening to both perspectives and I find it very informative, very educated. Uh, and it's something new for me, so I'm very grateful for that to both of you. Um, my question has sort of been covered earlier, but I really appreciate a much more clear uh, response from um, Mr. Ed Buckner. With regards to the afterlife, as Muslims we believe that after we die, our soul will live on and we will be held accountable for our actions, our intentions, what we did, what we saw, what we thought, and so on and so forth. What is the atheist alternative to this? Can I, can I, as someone who you believe should consider atheism, truly believe that my end, as a normal, boring, average student who lives in London, 
have not murdered anyone, not raped anyone, not robbed anyone, will be exactly the same, you know, soil and worm food as Hitler, who killed 6 million Jews and because of those 65 million people died in the world wars, as Pete Suckling, Suckling who raped and killed 17 women. Is my end really the same as this, as George Bush, who's responsible for the, the murder of hundreds and thousands in Iraq and Afghanistan? Is my end, my normal, boring existence end, the same as all these? I I think your ultimate existence is the same as all of those, uh, and I think that wishing that it were different will not change the facts at all. Now, I do think there is a difference. Surely you have a better ability to sleep at night than George Bush. Sorry to interrupt you, but what I'm asking for is an alternative. What is the atheist alternative? If you criticize what I'm saying and my opinion and, and my religious Why do you I do what is the atheist alternative? What, what I, do you believe if I can after you die? Yeah, if I could give you an alternative uh, that, that led to something better than this life, sure, I would do that. I mean, I'm not opposed to a future life of rewards and punishments. And Thomas Jefferson, one of our greatest leaders, believed in such a thing, even though he was certainly not a Christian. Uh, so I, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be wonderful somehow to imagine that justice ultimately will be done. I'm not saying that there's not uh, a, a very tantalizing uh, uh, possibility about a future life. I think that's what has kept the irrational idea of a future life alive for generations and generations of human beings, Muslims, Christians, and others, that there is some future life. But that's not evidence that there is any such future life. The fact that you want it, I want to win the lottery and I haven't done it yet. Desire does not produce what you want. So I, I would urge you to live a realistic life to understand that when you die, you're gone and there is no more. You'll have the same kind of feeling and existence and pain and everything else after you die as you had before you were born. None at all. There's nothing to worry about. You're not going to hell. There isn't anything in the future. I can't prove that. I'm not trying to insist that it must be true. But there is no evidence to the contrary. The fact that you believe there is or want to believe it, but intensely want to. I, I, I can accept I can accept that your your opinion is pretty rounded and pretty open to it can go this way or that way. Can you suggest then as as advice to me that maybe I should live the life of a drug baron in South Colombia? who live very healthy lives, very happy lives, they rob, they cheat, they steal, and they die peacefully in their sleep. They live rich lives, they eat good food, they sleep with many women. Is this the best advice for me? Is this the sort of life I should do? If I only got one shot, if who knows what's going to happen after? Is that the best thing for me to do? If the only thing that is keeping you from robbing and raping and so forth is Islam, I definitely want you to keep your faith. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. But you should keep it knowing that that has nothing to do with whether your faith is true or not, only whether it's effective in keeping you from raping and robbing and stealing. Life matters, and how you live it matters, and I certainly recommend that you live a life that you can be proud of, that you can sleep well at night, that you're happy with, uh, and that your neighbors and your friends will respect you for. Uh, I'm not suggesting that there should be no standards. I'm saying there can be no ultimate objective standards. The standards come from humanity. We're all we've got, so we better make the best of it. Okay, we'll now take a question from this side. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Nicole. Um, this question was asked to me by an atheist, and I didn't actually know how to answer it, but it's more to do with Islamic principles. Uh, the question was, um, does Islam contradict itself when it states that brothers and sisters and close relatives cannot marry and reproduce together? And um, isn't this the case happened with Adam and Eve at the start of humanity? I think this question is probably Okay, so the, the question is, in Islam, we can't have incest, basically. But you're saying, how from Adam and Eve can yeah. they reproduce? All I know, to be honest, I haven't even listened to this question, but what I know is, is that our rulings now apply based upon the teachings of the Qur'an and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad And what does the Qur'an say? The Qur'an says that we can't do incest and the Prophet never practiced it and told us not to do it either. 
Now what happened with Adam and Eve is a different reality, and to be honest, I haven't investigated it. I'm sure someone in the audience will give you a really nice answer. One answer I have heard, but the reason I'm not saying it is because I don't know if it's true or not. But so I'm gonna say it, but it might be based on untruth. Is that it was allowed then, but now it's not allowed. Something like that. But I, I don't really have the answer. Yeah, just for I, I, I could help with it. Oh, totally. Okay. Yeah. Chairs are doing something, right? Because we have bits of paper all day. But anyway, basically, yes, the, the, the ruling was that they had eat, they had pairs of twins, and the ruling was that the twins could not marry each other. So they could marry other sets of twins. So this was an anomalous situation, and therefore the, the kind of inherent, disgusting act of incest was actually waived for that, suspended for that point in time. Okay, thank you, Chair. Very, very unbiased, huh? <laughs> well, the other argument against that, because that's the only information I knew of, well, but the other argument was, well, something was wrong at the start, but now, no, something was right at the start, so now it's wrong. Could okay. then be twins, does not make them not brothers and yes, sisters? Yes, that's a good point. But when you talk about morality, mm -hmm. you could have, if the two situations were exactly the same, there would be a moral contradiction. But the two situations are not the same anymore. Do you see? Because one's based upon we need to have a human race, there's a specific historical context and time, and now we have a different kind of reality, do you see? So the, the contradiction would be apparent if the conditions and variables are exactly the same. But they're not. Okay, well, sorry to long it out, but there was another question to that as well. And that was, um, well, wasn't the God strong enough to make two couples? And their children could have reproduced. Yeah, I, I think that's an erroneous question because then you could ask it answers say in so many ways. Wasn't God strong enough to do this and that and this? This is the way He chose it and that's it. I don't think it negates Islamic theology or Christian theology or religious worldview. I mean, at the end of the day, the most simplest answer is this. Look, it's true because God said so. And that's not irrational because we can prove that God actually said it based upon the rational deduction we have shown in other arguments which Dr. Ed Buckner still has not addressed. <laughs> okay, question now. Uh, I'm going to so so stop debating when I read the Quran and write it back and say it didn't work, but he'll give up his ministry, right? My ministry? Um, yeah. Okay, this is now the, the, the brother who, the forgetful brother who's involved is the one who remembered. We don't want that to happen. My question for Dr. Yeah, Dr. Buckner. Dr. Buckner. Would you disagree with an atheist who thought that killing people is a right and because it's for his own benefit? And if so, based on what would you disagree since you don't believe in objective morality? And then if you do, um, if you do accept it, then yes, it is okay if that's his personal beliefs. Then, yeah, that, that's what they believe then wouldn't, yeah, then if we were all atheists, they wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be able to really find a common ground and wouldn't be able to um, you know, get together because each person would have a different belief on what's right and what's wrong. And so is it not better for the world to not accept atheism because it wouldn't cause any, you know, like I said. <laughs> so basically yeah. a question about subjective morality and about, oh, I, I agree with I, I did hear him. I understood. Uh, At least I think I did. If I'm this sorry, you tell me. I hope. Uh, I, if I knew an atheist who thought it was okay or a good idea for him to kill some people because it would be a, an advantage to him, would I argue with him and if so on what grounds? That so, so summarizes more or less what you said, yes? The answer is, of course I would argue with him. I would argue with him on a number of grounds. Uh, first and foremost, uh, criminal law. I mean, he's going to get put in jail or, or uh, executed if he engages in those things, so it's not in his best interest. Secondly, the basis for criminal law is because we human beings matter to each other. We should have standards that prevent uh, killing uh, under the circumstances you talk about. In different cultures, at different points, in different times, killing in some ways is permitted, and I think that's true for Islam as well as for others, uh, for capital punishment, uh, in self-defense, and that sort of thing. There get, there get to be very serious disagreements about these moral standards. And by the way, secular countries, countries like Sweden and Japan, have lower criminal uh, activity and lower problems with the things we usually associate with morality than the more religious countries do. Uh, the US is, uh, my question is, would you accept 
that he thinks it's okay to no. do whatever. No. Why? Based Why? On because we human beings are. We are social animals. We're not in this uh, on our own. Yeah, but that's what you believe. That's what you believe personally. There's I would, no I would disagree with the consensus. I would disagree and with the consensus. And if there was an atheist consensus, then wouldn't that mean that atheism is just another religion? I don't think atheism is just another religion, and I would disagree with that atheist on the, pretty much the same grounds that Hamza does, except that I wouldn't refer to the Quran or to Allah in explaining it to him. I would say it's not your best interest, it's not in the interest of society, it's against the law, it's destructive so of you're the culture. To, so you're referring and, to yourself then? Which is all anybody does. Yes, and him referring to himself is better to kill whatever person. Maybe they know the dog No, no, it's, it's the same for everybody, including my good friend Hamza here and all of you. No, you would our, say our, that it came from God, God based, based on our facts, personal it does not. Things. Our moralities are not based on our personal reference. It's based on what God tells us to live on. But you're saying that we should base our beliefs on our own reference. I'm saying you do base no. it on what your culture, what your uh, evolved social uh, setting has, has taught you. Well, and, not, and then you not, say, oh, okay, it's reinforced by what's in the Quran. That's what I believe, or the Bible, or whatever, the Book of Mormon. So but in fact, said, human beings don't behave that way. In reality, human beings develop what they want to do, then they find standards for it, and it, fortunately, there are many standards that we can develop out of self-interest. Out of, uh, it's not, uh, my friends, the objective is claim that that's an objective standard, and I disagree, but it is a basis for developing uh, moral standards, and it's one we use and have for thousands and thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of generations. Okay, we'll finish that discussion there. We'll just take one more question from this side. You are welcome to come and speak to any of the speakers after the debate tonight uh, and address your questions personally. So uh, thank you very much for being patient. Uh, unfortunately, we've only got a fixed amount of time. So we'll just take one question on that side and then we'll have the final three minute summary from each speaker. Okay, um, I've got two questions. The first one is, uh, one question. Um, how do you explain the fact that we are on Earth and that we exist as atheists? How, how do I explain that we, we human beings exist? Yeah, how do you explain the fact that we're here talking now? Well, it will uh, only take me a few hours, but uh, let me give it a stab. Uh, Biologically, we exist because of evolution. Uh, the processes which are now very well understood uh, evolved from a variety of other animals. I started to say lower animals, but actually there's no lower and higher in evolution. But if we evolve from animals, how can there still those animals around today? Well, all of the animals that are around today evolved from earlier uh, varieties of animals. And if you trace it all the way back, we have common ancestors. But it's not that we replace the monkeys or that we replace the insects. All of the animals and, and plants and bacteria and other uh, forms of life that are around today evolved from earlier forms and ultimately probably from only one form. And how that happened, no one knows yet. And I certainly don't claim that I do either. Now there's something that's far more important probably, at least to us, than mere biological evolution, and that's cultural development, which has some things in common with evolution. It does change over time, it does get selected out by uh, various pressures, but it's not at all the same thing as biological evolution. And I don't think that that uh, tells us what our moral standards should be in either case. Our moral standards have to come from how we think we should treat each other and how we should have a rich and full life, and pretending that they came from a god doesn't help in any case and often hurts in many cases. So how we got here is a long and complicated story and it is a matter of cultural development, learning from each other from generation to generation and from group of human beings to other human beings as well as biological evolution. Okay, can I just say that, do you think that there's a reason for everything that happens? I'm sorry? Do you think there's a reason for everything that happens? I don't understand about everything. Like that. you said, for everything that happens, there's a reason for it. Oh, there's a cause. I, I think within the natural world, within anything we know anything about, there is a cause so for everything. As, and as the as ultimate as cause is the universe itself.
and the processes that are developed, uh, that are the physical processes of the universe, and that they did not have a cause. And I think that that is exactly equivalent, uh, theoretically, to saying there is a God and he didn't have a cause. You know, you don't really have a first cause available to anybody, whether they're religious or not. Uh, you, you have to say somewhere it started, you want to believe it was a God, you can say it was Allah, but you have no evidence for that. I say the universe, the natural universe just is, it's a brute fact. It wasn't caused, we don't know why the Big Bang happened, it probably, probably wasn't a why, an answer to that. Okay, I think we're gonna, we're gonna the discussion's gonna carry on as I said afterwards because we've got a tight schedule. We also need to pray Maghrib Salah. Uh, Dr. Butler won't be leading it, I think that's quite safe to say. Um, it's Quran, you know, he hasn't read I, the Quran. I suspect that the conversation will carry on for a very long time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, first and foremost, thank you for being positive participants in today's discussion. I think what we have understood here, that there wasn't any strong case for the atheist worldview, and the arguments we proposed today were not deconstructed. So there wasn't a deconstruction of the Quran, obviously he hasn't read it, and he came here uh, in absence of information. Secondly, there was no deconstruction of the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the rational and logical deduction that we delivered today. Significantly, there was a misconstrual of the first argument of that God makes sense of the origins of the universe, misconstruing it with the prime mover argument and the first cause argument, which wasn't, and I give you the logical summary of it, whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. Since premise one and two are accurate and sound, the conclusion is sound and correct, something that Dr. Ed Buckner hasn't dealt with at all. But you know what? I'm going to let him speak and let you guys think about this until you die. I think what's very important is to speak about something else, and I have about a minute and a half, and it's actually to reflect on your own sense of being. Okay? What does it mean to be a human being? What it means to be a human being is actually to really introspect very carefully. You know, we have huge egos, we always ex do exospection, we always look outside of ourselves, but rarely do we think within ourselves. Now in Islam we have a concept called the fitra, which is the natural innate disposition, which is supported by external arguments such as anthropologists from the University of Pennsylvania, they said if you put kids on a desert island, they're going to have this inclination for spirituality, this inclination to believe in God and His oneness. That inclination cannot be justified biologically. It doesn't have an evolutionary justification. And when we reflect upon this, it would give us the driving force and the inspiration and our souls will shake with awe to be trying to find out what really is our purpose and how do we fix this mess that we have created in the human world. And I would argue that Islam is a very positive solution from the economic, social, justice and even foreign policy perspective. Something that would only require us to, as the Chinese say, empty our teacup, which take away the tea that we have, you want to taste new tea, empty your teacup, and then re-embrace different ideologies and perspectives in that positive way. So all I have to say to you brothers and sisters and friends, thank you very much for taking your time out on a Saturday to start thinking about deep questions about man, life in the universe, and I would end with a verse in the Quran which says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And thus, do we explain our signs, our evidences in detail for those who reflect. Keep reflecting. Jazakallah here. Thank you very much for listening. depends, as he has said, uh, on three points. The first of which proves my side of the argument, despite his saying that it did not, he never demonstrated to the contrary. And the other two points are the same kind of arguments you find with any religion, any religious view, and they can't all be right. So it's possible that he's established that yours is the right one. As soon as I finish reading this, I'll let you know. But in fact, other people who have read it, many other people have discovered no such uh, magic, no such evidence of an eternal guidepost. Uh, and on the other hand, you have 
uh, my case, the God of the gaps was shrunk, the, uh, the God that was necessary to explain things we didn't understand is lesser and lesser and smaller and smaller because we understand more and more things. And the worldwide pointless suffering that we see, not only in humanity, but across uh, all species, is cons and, and, and the variation that you see in religious belief and in moral standards, all of these things are consistent with the lack of a God, the lack of a designer, the lack of a giver of moral uh, uh, standards. And that does not, I guess, prove atheism, but, it, but it's something he has not responded to or answered. We have to test for truth, and we agree on that. But when we test for truth, you can't just uh, take the circular part of, well, okay, I believe in uh, the Koran is beautiful, and therefore I'll check and see, is it beautiful? Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, you start with that conclusion, you're going to find that conclusion. Uh, Religion makes human life worse overall. Some religions more than others. I don't mean that all religions are equally destructive of human life and happiness. Islam has done its share of causing uh, harm and unhappiness in the world. So certainly has Christianity and Judaism and uh, Buddhism and other religions as well. Uh, there, there is no objective morality and claiming that there is, simply asserting that there is, does not make it true. Uh, I would respectfully submit uh, that in this case, uh, Mr. Hamza Sortis did not make his case. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, just like to remind uh, the audience here that there are still a couple of other debates and discussions in this series. So thank you very much for attending. We will now break from Malik Salah. And I now leave you with a uh, Islam greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.